So let's kick off and talk about the security conundrum. And so what this kind of uh, you know came down to when I started researching this this topic and looking at how we were going to uh, meet some of the key key requirements and and key elements of, of as we talk about the different things is trying to find out and strike this balance between what organizations are doing where they are and where cloud and organizations have moved to in 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 the current kind of market and so one of the things that struck me is is that a lot of the early adopters a lot of the early developers were very focused around building uh, CRE teams, so cloud center of excellence teams, or had small agile teams that were very focused, usually highly skilled. So those early adopters uh, is very much around um, focusing on trying to get that those first workloads, do business justification, prove that the cloud was a worthwhile mechanism to actually use, and and was very very focused around trying to actually just get it done. They had this very get it done attitude, which also proved that the value of the cloud was around this speed. They brought in new types of working, so this agile working uh, uh, style, and that brought with it a whole set of new problem. Well, new new brought in a whole set of new working and and ability to actually develop, and so that change, which is fundamental to actually allowing for part of that dev ops uh, and the mix of those that dev and ops is it's fundamental to this process around why cloud has become successful however when you look at those small groups they were usually low in numbers they usually worked as a very tight uh, tight knit community they knew what usually knew what everyone was doing they had a high skill level so they understood the services that they were building on and what those services would be delivering there was a lot smaller number or fewer number of, of services available. Um, and so building and getting those first workloads into the cloud kind of uh, was easy to actually make sure that that was done in the best practices and secure way. As you start to scale this out and as you start to see organizations started to take on whatever version of 2.0 cloud, 3.0, whatever you want to call it, you're starting to see this, the majority adopter bring coming in and the majority adopter for, for cloud, they've established that it's a good thing. They know that the cloud is going to happen. They understand all of the business values, but they're doing this at a very large scale. So they're doing this across maybe hundreds and hundreds of developers. They're looking at this across, how do we bring in uh, non-technical folk to actually be able to take advantage of this? And those things are then bringing in the challenges of, well, how do we, keep this new way of working that we established this ag agility this ability to put uh, new applications quickly in front of our customers make changes to those applications as we need to pivot for whatever reason be it pandemic or just to keep up with the you know the neighbors all of those things they want to keep but they're now understanding and seeing that the, ri the risks involved when allowing the broader community to be able to have access to that to that type of level of, uh, of speed and agility. So, how do you actually strike this balance between meeting compliance and and business and regulatory control? And I was particularly in the health industries and um, in some of the business uh, financial and insurance industries, they have you know strict regulatory control that you need to be able to actually meet. So how do you find it and strike this balance? And so this balance is fundamentally what we will be looking at how we can actually combine tools such as Terraform and Vault and, and the, those tools that allow you to actually innovate and to build quickly. But how do you actually do that with, with the guardrails and safety rails that, are, that the majority adopters and larger organizations? And to be fair, any organization that is looking to do this uh, to go to market with and, and, and to de depend on, how can they take advantage of, of this balance of trying to find security in, uh, in it? And so as I was working through this, I thought this was a really interesting report. So Microsoft does this, its um, annual defense report. And within this digital uh, defense report, 
the, the number that I, I found really interesting is that 98% of attacks are protected using basic hydrate. So for me, this was a construct that's, that struck that by using known elements and known best practices that are established, that have been well established and have learned over time, we can actually mitigate, you know, 98% of the um, of the general attacks out there. There are always going to be those sophisticated ones. They're always going to be, you know, potentially state derived uh, attacks. But basic hygiene is going to deal with 98% of those uh, that, those attack runs. And so things like applying zero trust, which is a concept we'll talk about a little bit more uh, later. How to use um, known frameworks. Uh, how to how to leverage things like the cloud adoption framework or the well-architected framework, understanding what those best practices bring in, understanding what those security requirements are and how to meet them. So there is knowledge and established practices that will actually help you mitigate that basic attack line. It's not going to do everything and obviously you need to still apply other tools to actually help with that, but the bulk of uh, bulk of the defense is there. So, you know, from the, from the home, Andy and I were talking about renovating you know, from a home, a home perspective, you know, just remembering to lock your front and back door is going to stop most of that, uh, most of that general wandering in off the street. Then you can layer in, you know, your alarms and your, you know, your dog and although my dog would never do anything other than welcome everyone, um, you know, uh, alarms and then cameras and all the other things that you want to put over the top of your, your general house security but just remembering to lock the doors and windows you know is is the basic thing that is probably going to give you the most secure for not a lot and so I thought that was a really interesting construct in terms of thinking about how to approach security and of course Microsoft and HashiCorp have this shared vision around how we can actually help and accelerate uh, not just the adoption but also the adoption in a uh, in a strong way across a multi-cloud and a, a hybrid cloud scenario. So, you know, this this joint relationship where you know the two organisations work together to look to find solutions and innovations that, that products can help and tooling can help you establish the best practices. Now, whether it's leveraging CAF uh, and a Terraform cloud, or leveraging the CAF model with uh, one of the open sources to build those regu regulatory uh, changes. And so. When I was starting to think about, well, what does this look like? It's very much centered around, you have your business users or your, your, your business, so the internal access, moving through into customer access from the other side. And at the core of this, we have obviously uh, identity. And so identity is this move around into thinking around zero trust. And so zero trust is this construct where we start to apply uh, an identity or a known identity around an individual or machine or um, application and we know exactly who that is as opposed to that old school way of thinking in uh, traditional enterprise when I first started cutting my teeth where you had the outer harder outer shell and then you had sub subsequent layers of protection within that with the good old firewall systems and, and multiple um, division um, or defense and defense in depth doesn't mean that that isn't a good approach and it's still something to take into account when building but we want to actually start identifying individuals as that as that perimeter has now moved to be wherever it could possibly be and so as we start to think about how we layer on these different services so such as sentinel or, or defender so you start to have to think about how we can include these into our deployments. And this is where, and there's an example of this, um, a great example of this on, on the Learn site, where you can use automation tools to now build out those components. You can use automation tools to include uh, things like Packer, to include Sentinel into your deployment, into your image builds, so that when they spin up, they are automatically reporting to the right, um, uh, to the right construct. We're including zero trust access, identity, thinking about how we profile and define who is allowed to do what. We're giving them the least amount of privileges. And this is another key element of thinking around that approach is how do we build and allow people just the right level of access at just the right amount of time. And so then as this moves through into how do we apply this to our data, 
and to our management plans. This is where we start to see and thinking about this ad adoption of either standards, so security benchmarks, CIS, uh, uh, checking what we've already done using the well architected framework to actually assess workload con constructs as they are moved. Have we actually met all of the criteria? Have we actually uh, signed off and, um, and met, met all of those standards? And even you know before we're looking to do that, uh, approaching it from the, uh, the cloud adoption framework around how do we build out all of those associated things that we need. So within the CAF, for example, from a business alignment, we're thinking about how do we do you know, a risk assessment, how do we do, uh, how and what security standards do we need to apply? How does that impact our business? Are we still, are, have we put too many barriers in place? How do we get this balance? And going back to that first thinking around, how do we get strike the balance between uh, speed and agility and, uh, and secure and compliance? And so this thinking of and shifting uh, that security as early as possible, which is where the shift left uh, construct comes from. I know Andy's going to go into that a little bit more. Is where the, is setting up this thing around. We're keeping the agility, but we're starting to shift where we're thinking about security earlier into that process. And so this allows us then to get access uh, into apply things and security elements around the access control. Uh, how do we get and make sure that everything is being reported to a singular point? So using tooling such as you know using um, Terraform Cloud or Vault to to, uh, uh, to cor correlate all of that information and send it into Sentinel as a as a um, as a scene to be able to monitor. So we have who's doing what, when, why into a single place. We can see what actions are being taken. We started to put policies and use policy as code. So this concept of um, being able to apply um, control in the same way that you're building your infrastructure. So using either, and just to be really confusing, HashiCorp Sentinel. So that's a, a standard that we have within our, our Terraform cloud that can apply this thinking of policy as closed. So you can apply policies or you can use op, uh, OPA policies. Uh, so open, uh, open standard. Uh, and that allows for again, this thinking around using as code. So we still have the agility because we've codified it. We still have the speed, but we're now applying that in a highly uh, highly agile and adaptive way. And so from a tooling perspective, HashiCorp fits in, obviously in conjunction with the Azure platform. And so we could take a construct like our, like our landing zone. So we have our, potentially one of our uh, great examples out of the, the CAF, landing zones, for example, and those CAF modules are hosted in Terraform registry. There's a great subset of examples within those that are built around best practices. They have tagging applied, they have, uh, they meet all of the uh, well-architected framework criteria. And so you can take those building block examples that are opinionated. So you're not just given, here's your Lego blocks and get on with it. You're actually given, here's, Here's, here's Legos, here's your Lego city, uh, as I stub my toe on Lego blocks quite regularly with our kids. Um, here's the Lego city, you have all of the constraints, it's opinionated, you have the best practices. You can now use that as part of your build process. And within that, you have your, um, you know, your version control that, that is hosted out of. <coughs> you can use and, and adapt something like uh, the private uh, module registry in, in Terraform Cloud, which allows you to then enforce where and what code is actually being run as part of that infrastructure as code. So you can you can validate the template, it meets your security standards, you can apply a Sentinel policy or, or an OPA policy to it to say it can only be done at this time in this environment with this tags and uh, and against this private module registry which stops people using open source code that could or could not have malicious intent in the involved in it. And then as that runs through and builds into particular workspaces, you then deploy that Terraform Cloud is now supports OI, uh, Open Connect, so uh, OIDC, which means that we can now authenticate that automatically against, uh, uh, against AD and give, and this is the important part, going back to that thinking around lease position, positions, permissions even, uh, 
we can give the, the right permission to the user at that runtime. So as, as they do a plan or as they do an apply, they get the specific permission tasks that could be different across them for that specific time. So it's on demand uh, uh, credentials with the right, least privilege applied to it for that specific function. So then as you apply that and that build starts to run out, in that construct, there may be standing up a uh, an SOE environment or uh, a building out a database. And in that construct, we can then pull in uh, a vault dynamic secret. And Andy will talk about this different layer of the importance of those secrets where, where we can then dynamically place a secret into that run to then build out. As it stood up, we can then connect that using something like console to connect these different services within the uh, within the environments. Now, whether that's across multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, wherever that is, uh, one of the great things with console is obviously that it's not dependent on just a containerized environment. It's a full service mesh. So connecting to a database that had been previously built on another platform to allow you to take advantage of something like Power Apps or 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 or, or the other way around where uh, gives you this flexibility to actually to apply to, to build a true multi-cloud and particularly in the hybrid world where we know that a lot of database and, and some of the database elements are very difficult to move off of off of premise you can still have all of the advantage of building cloud native front ends and take and just take the advantage or, or use that that original data that, that has had been difficulty to move and so in a an actual practical sense in terms of that workload there is uh, this is an example of what you could potentially build. Uh, this isn't this isn't uh, isn't the be all and end all, but this is a good way of thinking about that process. So now you have your developers writing code, committing to a central uh, source, where that central source of truth uh, becomes uh, the construct around kicking off and building workloads. So that can, as we see. Uh, we actually have a, a demonstration in a minute where we, we kick off a build from uh, VCS that is using code sets that's from the private module registry. And again, this templatization and repeatability, we're building uh, specific workspaces in Terraform Cloud that have specific, uh, associated with a specific run. They have a common set of code that goes across it. So again, you're starting to think about how you do this testing early in the phase. So you test at the you know, as, a, as in the build process, you test at the for the dev example, you make sure that all the code that is going to go into production is, a, is is similar or the same, so that you're already understanding what risks and what um, vulnerabilities could potentially be there, and you're addressing them as early as possible in that testing lifecycle. We then have least pr privileges to actually uh, uh, allow for that to run. We apply a sentinel check which is enforcing compliance and audit controls and uh, and basic security principles over that we stand up that environment and as that environment builds it pulls in a, a, a image that has been built with packer that image as i said maybe drops in a sentinel agent so now as that image builds it stands up it has all of the agents already reporting back into an established environment and we do config management um, or changes as as needed to actually stand up the overall environment. So this thinking around how this builds out is that we are then applying uh, testing and security to this model. And so I did mention uh, you know earlier around a great example. This is actually from Microsoft's Learn site itself. There is a, a really good uh, example on there of uh, Defender deployed using Terraform. So again, thinking about how you can use automation to stand up and build your tooling so that as you start to create these um, or your security tooling should I say so as you are starting to build those individual environments and start and starting to build those individual uh, uh, bnets or, or elements you can actually remember to lock the front door you know and you can use this process to into integrate that into your build process which I think is you know a really good example of where we uh, we can see so jumping into you know, a quick demo. What we have here is uh, we have an environment where I have uh, an image. Uh, we have a, a local runner, and in that we are using Terraform Cloud to inject a, circus, a secret a circus. No, we can't inject a circus. The elephants would never love it. Um, so in in that construct, we have uh, a static secret here 
that we are going to inject, in this case, our secret provided by Vault. So in this case, obviously, it's a static secret. This could be a dynamic secret. This could be a key. It could be anything that is uh, as you needed to be injected as part of this. But for this run, we are using a key. We have a, uh, a, a repository where we have a, an action set up. Within that, we actually have access to Vault dynamically uh, configured. So there's a Vault access key. That access key, uh, as I will show here, has uh, a very specific set of permissions around it. So we have a policy applied to that endpoint. So Vault is offering up as an API endpoint. That endpoint has a policy applied to it that is only allowed to do specific things. In this case, we, a specific authenticated user can only read from that endpoint. So again, you're creating least privilege, you're getting an identity, so in a known element, being able to authenticate to Vault to do something with the least amount of privileges. And then you know, this is actually set with a, uh, a TTL. So this is valid for 24 hours, hopefully. Otherwise, uh, otherwise we're going to have uh, all sorts of problems. Uh, and this will uh, this will then run and have uh, a, a, an element that we can renew. So again, this token is only available for a specific amount of time. So in, in a production run, you may do this for maybe eight hours or, or even less if, if it's uh, if it's not particularly heavy usage on uh, a renewal. So you're, again, you're, key, you're reducing your attack surface by reducing the amount of time a, a access key is available. It's dynamically rotated. So you're refreshing this on a, on a regular basis. So if someone does manage to compromise it, they can't use that again. And all of these things taking those steps to actually reduce that, um, that attack that surface. So if we build, um, if we build our Docker image, you can see that as part of building our Docker image, we have we create a directory in that directory. If we just run it, uh, just to prove, uh, there is the unset secret. So that's that's the element that as we run this build image and kick it off, we're going to actually replace that and inject dynamically by pulling from Vault a, a secret to it, that you know secret provided by Vault that we saw into this construct. And so if we make a change here, uh, we just, uh, let's see, add. Let's see if I can remember all the right commands. early in the morning, need more tea. There we go. So we kick that off and now hopefully we should see our build kicked off. So there's our build as it runs through. If we inspect this, we can see what's going on. So we have got our, start, our job locally started. It's going through, it's pulled us, it's imported our secret. It's gone away and built our image. And as it job completes, there we go. We should now be able to go back. And if we run our Docker image now, you can see that we've pulled that uh, secret from Vault. So as our image is built and stood up, we've actually pulled that dynamic secret. So whether that was for database access or app access or, or whatever element that is, obviously that allows you to uh, have that flexibility. And this is, very much also thinking about how you could do this first, the first secret. So how do you get the first secret to allow you to then do rotated secrets uh, and, and established um, uh, establish access into, you know, into Vault and using dynamic secrets. This is a great way of being able to get that first secret in to then stand it up, get authenticate, understand what it is, rotate that first secret out as quickly as possible to again, reduce your pro attack profile. So, with that, you can see this is kind of the build image that we did. This is uh, from a understanding the workflow. You know, this is uh, HashiCorp Vault on Azure. So uh, you can actually use a self-managed uh, SaaS version of uh, Vault, which is now available on Azure. So you can have access to all those great Azure regions. We are um, using a token um, to actually identify into the Vault. And this is then uh, the endpoint that we're talking to to actually pull that out. Um, and so that was that was basically what 
what you have just seen in terms of the uh, workflow. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Andy to go into some of the details around kind of where we fit in uh, to the Microsoft uh, deeper dive. Over to you. Awesome. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you, David. So we're going to talk a little bit, as David mentioned, about the Microsoft and HashiCorp Zero Trust Partnership. But before I go further, I'd like to kind of go a little bit over what Zero Trust is in case um, there are folks who are less familiar with it. So the idea of Zero Trust is, well, you don't trust everybody who uh, comes into your, your area. So we always want to authenticate. Uh, we also want to make sure we uh, reduce the, the blast radius by making sure that uh, folks who are authorized or authenticated don't have access to everywhere. Uh, someone who is in your network doesn't automatically have access to all your servers, all your VMs, your databases, et cetera. And then lastly, we also want to make sure that we're securing everything internally as well. So just because you have services uh, talking to each other internally within your network doesn't mean that we don't want to secure those uh, permissions or secure the, the traffic and the data going between them. So how does that look like with uh, Microsoft and HashiCorp products? We're going to start with the top left with HashiCorp Vault, and that is the secret management. It handles ephemeral secrets, uh, credentials that can be dynamically generated, uh, as David mentioned earlier, and we'll go through some examples of that later on as well. On the top right, we then have console, which is the uh, advanced service mesh capabilities for things like Kubernetes or VMs. And this applies to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, the services within your network are now able to leverage console to talk and communicate uh, securely. On the bottom right, we then have boundary. So instead of uh, services talking to each other, we're now trying to make sure we secure uh, personnel to machine access, things like SSH or RDP. And then lastly, we have the bottom left with Terraform, which is the deployment the infrastructure as code. And it can leverage OIDC authentication, for example. Now, in the middle, we have Azure Active Directory. And the reason why we have it in the middle is because all HashiCorp tools have support for Azure Active Directory. And that helps support that zero trust uh, partnership. Azure Active Directory can help with multi-factor authentication. It can help with that authentication and authorization, and it can even help with that permissions. So when folks authenticate, we can, Azure Active Directory can be leveraged to ensure that only certain uh, services or areas have been granted access to them. So how does that look, oh, next slide, how, do, how does that look in the, um, in the actual uh, practice? Oh, thank you, Did. So we have on the left-hand side, deploy time secrets. So in this example, we're going to leverage uh, an example of uh, using Terraform, maybe deploying your infrastructure. And you could be using a uh, service principle in this case to authenticate to uh, Azure, or maybe to uh, connect to a backend state file, like in a blob storage. So from top down, you'll see that we have a, a zero trust score that we give these different authentication methods. So we have static secrets or certificates, which stay around for a long period of time and are less secure because in the event of a, uh, a breach or a vulnerability, those secrets can then be uh, leveraged by an attacker. We then move down to dynamic secrets. This is something that David had briefly covered a little bit. Uh, these are secrets that are generated on the fly that have a short window where they can be leveraged. So it limits that blast radius. So an example might be requesting for access at deploy time. And then after your deploy time, after a short period of time, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, that secret is that has then been deactivated. And then lastly, for the service principle um, section is Open ID, Open ID Connect or OIDC which is a personal favorite of mine. Uh, I'll leverage this in GitHub, for example. And the reason why I like it um, so much is because you can configure it. Um, well, you have to configure it on both sides. You have to configure it, of course, the credentials in your GitHub account, but you also have to configure it in Azure Active Directory within your service principle. And you define things like 
um, what environment that it's allowed to run in, what repository and organization that it can be actually run through. So if I only authorize a service principle to run under my own account in my organization, if that credential were then um, copied or, or taken away and leveraged in another repository, it would not have those same permissions. So it's very fine-tuned permissions for there. Now, lastly, we have managed identity. If you leverage a self-hosted um, Azure VM or container, you can leverage managed identities, whether it be system-defined or user-defined um, identities there. Now, no matter which one of these uh, secrets or um, you leverage or identities that you leverage, you always want to practice the principle of least privilege when assigning it to these uh, um, identities. And the idea is whatever service principle you have, you only want it to grant it access to the resources that it needs access to. If it has access to in, in a large number, maybe an entire subscription, it may have access to more things than it truly needs. Now that is for deploy time secrets. On the right hand side, we also have runtime secrets. So an example of that might be an application that needs access to an API or maybe a database. So at the top, again, we do have static secrets, things like an app configurations. Uh, those are the things that we want to stay away from. We do, we would prefer leveraging dynamic secrets again, uh, reaching out to HashiCorp Vault so that you can get uh, just-in-time access for whatever service that you need. And lastly, of course, we have managed identities again to um, as the, uh, the highest zero trust score there. Now, again, whether it's runtime secrets or deploy time secrets, we again want to leverage the principle of least privilege when assigning those uh, permissions. Well, the next slide for me, David. Thank you. So let's move on to shift left, which is also another topic that David had covered and we'll go into a little bit more in depth here. So the idea of shift left is that we want to well, shift left in our software development lifecycle. So here we have an example of that um, from left to right. You have your, your coding, the developer might be coding in an IDE, then they might be committing their code, building their code, and then finally deploying that code to an environment. And this is our sample SDLC uh, lifecycle. Shifting left means that we want to try and target those earlier phases. Instead of only scanning or only trying to look for vulnerabilities when the code is already in production and deployed, we want to try and find it earlier, maybe while the developer is still coding or maybe in the lower environments or during the PR. So I'm gonna go through each one of these phases. And then later on, um, I'll be also going to an example uh, specifically for Terraform and infrastructure as code. As not all of these will apply in those scenarios, but um, this is more from a development point of view. So on the far left side, we have the coding uh, portion, which is the IDE. And here you may leverage some extensions to lint your code. You may be paired programmed with another developer. And that can be another set of eyes um, uh, looking at uh, the code that you're writing to check for any vulnerabilities. In the next phase, you have the commit, which is things like uh, secret scanning. Uh, in GitHub, there is push protection, where in the event you have an API or a secret in your code and you're about to accidentally push it uh, into the repository, it will actually block it so that you don't have it you know, stuck in the uh, Git history. There are also things like uh, depend for dependency scanning and static code analysis. Next, we have peer uh, pull requests, and that's where you can have another set of eyes to the peer reviews. You can also run checks, and these can be things that are running in GitHub Actions in the pipelines. It could be checks to uh, do unit tests. It could be you know, building the code or even deploying the code, depending on the, um, how robust you want your checks to be. Finally, after the pull request is completed, you have your build phase, which then you can compile your code, run some unit tests. You can run a little bit more in-depth tests here to like integration tests as well. And then finally, you're going to deploy to your respective environments. Here we've given some examples of what tests could look like in each respective environment. In your lower environments, you may do some dynamic analysis, uh, manual tests. Uh, in a pre-prod, you might do some load tests or performance tests there. 
And then finally in production, you might do some smoke tests after deployment and, uh, and monitor your application. Now, I'll give you an example of how this might look in, in, in the real world, uh, because of course we want to find things earlier, but there's a lot of advantages too, not to, men not to mention um, of course cost, but also speed to remediate. So for example, if I'm the developer, I'm writing a feature and somebody comes to me and says, hey, Andy, hey, you wrote your code six months ago. Uh, it's already in production and uh, we just found the vulnerability. Can you help us fix this? Like, Absolutely, but let me remember what I wrote six months ago. It's, it's been a while. So you're gonna have to change context, remember what you did six months ago, why you did it at that time, and then remediate and then go through all the environments and phases. But instead, if we had done and shifted left and found that vulnerability, maybe at the build or even the test environment, someone can come back to me and say, hey, Andy, we found this vulnerability. You wrote it about a week, maybe two weeks ago. Um, can you help us remediate this before we go to production? Absolutely. And now that we're only talking about changes that I made in the last week or two, I'm going to remember the context of, of what I wrote. It'll be faster for me to context switch and, um, and uh, make those changes much faster. Next slide, please, David. All right, so now we can shift left also with DevSecOps, and we're going to focus this time with a, a Terraform example. So on the far left, we have Terraform CLI, where you can leverage the Terraform format or validate or plan to make sure that it follows the format and canonical, or canonical format and style. We want to maybe plan to make sure that it actually runs properly. In the next phase, we have Microsoft Defender for DevOps, which integrates to both GitHub and Azure DevOps. And it can also scan your HCL files, leveraging TerraScan to look for, to find for vulnerabilities. Microsoft Defender for DevOps is also a great place for security folks to have a higher level view. Instead of having to go through each repository or project, uh, you can have a high level view to see where the vulnerabilities are for, for all the projects in the organization. And then lastly, we have Terraform Cloud uh, where you can leverage run tests. And run tests are run between the plan and the apply stage. And they allow for third parties to be able to integrate uh, beforehand. So things like Prisma Cloud, Sneak, Bridge Crew, or HCP Packer. Um, Packer, for example, could be could have a run task that validates the VM images that you're referencing in Terraform. It could validate to make sure that those images haven't been revoked due to any security vulnerabilities, for example. And uh, one last slide, David. Thank you. Lastly, we do have uh, the Terraform Cloud policies, which can be uh, managed by Sentinel or open policy agent. So we can have your plan, your configuration and your state files as input. And it can help, and the policies can help check for vulnerabilities and also maybe your organizational compliance. Maybe there are some rules or policies that the organizations require, things like uh, tagging specific resources um, with a minimum set of fields. Uh, maybe there are some resource types that they want to stay within or leverage within your organization. As the output, there are uh, three different ways that it can be managed. There's advisory, which the pipeline will just let you know, hey, just FYI, uh, you should probably tag your resources, but I'll let you still continue. There's also soft mandatory, which will require an approval before you proceed. Or there's hard mandatory where you flat out just failed and says, hey, you have to go back and make your changes to make sure you're compliant. And that's all the areas that I wanted to cover. I'm gonna hand it back to David to uh, wrap it all up. Thank you. Uh, one thing, I would, uh, a great example of, of something we worked with a customer around this, this thinking that, that Andy was just talking about is that they actually used, um, they've been trying to get the developers to write more securely into, particularly in this early shift less thinking. And to, they tried the, they tried the carrot approach where they tried to encourage people and reward people for it hadn't really worked. So then they looked at trying to 
to use the stick approach. And so what they did was they used the um, Sentinel library that has, um, as I said, Center of uh, CIS, so Center of Internet Security uh, based policies around their uh, around their container deployments. It set in place baseline security that they needed to, to meet before they could actually deploy it. They then used the soft mandatory, which is a mechanism where you can over uh, the, someone with the right permissions can override it to get it to build. But what that per, who that person was was actually their manager. So then, as they built and went to deploy it, uh, this would throw up an alert that would go to the manager. The manager would see. He would then immediately go back to them and say, "Well, why have you done it this way?" Now, unless there was a particularly pressing reason, he would then force them to go back and, and meet all of the requirements they needed to, to actually just get it to pass rather than just letting them continue to build. And so within, I think it was in about six weeks, they found that they had basically retrained everybody to actually take on this thinking of, of, of applying best practices early on, building to those standards and actually getting it. And which improved that, you know, to, to Andy's point, not just improved their security standpoint, but also improved their overall uh, quality and remediation of the code being developed because it was they were building it right the first time as opposed to changing that mindset around, well, I'm, it's just dev or it's just test and, move, and I'll, I'll fix it in production. It really changed that whole mind and it changed it within the whole, uh, whole organization. So I think overall uh, applying and leveraging things like this with in combination with Vault, uh, the, one customer we, we know saw um, the simplification of, of managing their secrets and managing their overall uh, um, deployment time of having to create and establish all of this by about 70 full-time heads. So in overall, that's, you know, that's 70, uh, 70 heads being used on different things to create new projects rather than just having to think about managing their overall secret starts. So that's a very powerful set of customer examples around where this practically can actually happen and take place. Um, from, from a thinking perspective, and I, I think this is a, a really good example of where you can use things like uh, the modules. And I know I, there's a couple of questions around, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the CAF modules. In this construct, you can pull modules from, from the CAF, for example, regardless of which level that is. So whether that is deploying uh, leveraging the rover construct or whether you actually use the uh, super module to actually break that apart and actually pulling in separate individual com build components. You can use those modules, so that those resource modules, to then create an overarching stack deployment. So that takes the database function, your resource group, the necessary elements to combine those together, meeting those standards, enforcing tagging, enforcing policies, putting them together to create a stack. And then that stack is then used to punch out uh, and deploy uh, into your environments. And you can then enforce that with different policies to say, well, different elements of this cannot be, uh, be used. Now, whether that's tying down um, which, which module that is, so you can't, in this case, you can't use the resource module or, or pinning down a particular uh, resource provider. So you, you're making sure that, um, they're only using a provider that has passed and made uh, and is validated as part of the um, testing cycle. So again, you, you know that there are all the vulnerabilities tested against that provider. You know what those security risks are. You're limiting the uh, blast radius and, and enforcing it dynamically, which is I think the important part. So you're giving the autonomy back to the developer to say here, use these elements and go for it, but you're still, you're still doing that within the construct of keeping the training wheels on and making sure that they are a bit guided, they are meeting best practice and they are they are only doing what corporate security will actually allow them to do. So with all great things, uh, it comes to an end. So uh, we are finishing up. And so if you'd like to go and uh, go and try this, please feel free to go and you know, sign up for a, a Zool subscription, sign up for Terraform Cloud, it's free as well. Uh, there is also um, Terraform products on the Azure Marketplace if you want to leverage your marketplace uh, and Azure Marketplace to, to do any of your purchasing. Um, there is also a, 
a great ebook that Microsoft and uh, HashiCorp co-developed around uh, where to fit into Zero Trust, what that builds out. A lot of the topics we've talked about uh, today, expanding on some of those. Um, there was a question around uh, examples. So uh, one of the things that uh, we are currently working on is we're working with the security, uh, Microsoft security team to actually come up with a whole uh, whole range of uh, uh, examples and documentation and blog posts that actually go into this in a lot a lot more detail and give people a lot better tools to actually go and do it do things in a, in a real world sense so how does uh, the example is you know as you said mentioned the, the example is great but it makes a whole bunch of assumptions around you know your admin control and a whole bunch of stuff how do you do that in uh, enterprise level in a real world and so we're working together to actually create that and there will be further information and joint um uh, events and, me and mechanisms together to actually drive that. So uh, this is the kind of the starting point for that, and and we will actually develop this as the year goes on. So, um, so thank you. I think.